Right now, we're going to John Garcia. Man, we got so many things to pick your brain about. Uh, John Garcia, I hope all is well. Welcome into the game in T-Town. Doing well, Ryan. It's um, it's almost that time for signing day for us, but uh, a lot going on up there in Tuscaloosa. My goodness, can't keep up. No, it is. It's it's rather difficult to be honest with you. And I know that 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 you've got some thoughts, and and we'll tie all this to recruiting. I know we've got a lot of things to ask you, uh, but when you look at all these coaching changes from someone who's played the game at the highest level, you've been following and recruiting uh, for many many years, dialed in on this program. What is your overall thoughts when you see this many assistant coaches departing and so many assistant coaches coming in? Well, I think we always try to look at Nick Saban and, and try to figure out what he's doing overall, right? Almost like a theme. Last year, what did he do? Younger coaches, guys who understood recruiting in this modern era, social media, all of that energy, and they, they did their job, right? Um, the number one recruiting class this year, which is, was pretty much their foundation, et cetera. Obviously, on field, didn't finish the way you wanted. So it just seems like naturally, now Nick is kind of cycling back. Uh, I know there's been a whole lot of, let's get the band back together when you think of guys like Sal Ciceri, think of guys like Charles Kelly, who obviously have extensive experience, not only with Nick and the process, but in the state of Alabama, et cetera. So I think there is some credence to that. I think that, that makes a lot of sense, familiarity, the process and all of that. I mean, think about that that coaching staff last year. How many of those guys knew in and out what every day of the process is supposed to feel like, look like, um, execute like, from practice to study hall check to bed check at camp, whatever. How many of those coaches knew that in and out, like the back of their hand? Not many, right? So I think so part of it is, is kind of getting back to that culture. And obviously, look, there's there's a certain pool of guys available and there's a certain pool of guys who are willing to come back. It's not easy to work under Nick Saban at Alabama. I don't think anybody would, would tell you that. So it takes a lot, I think, on the other end for those guys to willingly come back. Uh, and I think it still shows you what coaching at Alabama right now still means to these guys. So I think you're getting a little bit of everything. Obviously, a ton of turnover overall, but now there's, there's a little bit more experience coming back towards Nick Saban and not only experience at Alabama, but experience specifically under Nick with the process. And I think getting back to that culture a hundred percent is, is a big priority for him as he tries to find that blend between ace recruiters, experienced position coaches, play callers, developers, et cetera. It's, it's, it's kind of a happy medium. I think is the end result of these last two years where maybe you were great on field, not so much in recruiting national title, not a national recruiting title, and then you flip it the following year, recruiting title, not a national title on the field. So now it's a, a bit of a, a blend of both of those last two staffs, um, you know, within reason, because obviously some guys were promoted elsewhere, head coaches, et cetera. So it's tough, but I think it's, it's going to be a blend of these last two staffs, but a lot of familiarity to help bridge some of those gaps uh, as opposed to some of the younger coaches who maybe were a little bit short in that department. We're talking to John Garcia, John Garcia underscore junior, available college football recruiting analyst, 247 sports, BamaOnline.com, Crimson and Blue Chips, the podcast, great way to follow those guys, CABC pod, as uh, John Garcia plugged into what's happening here in Tuscaloosa. So, John, we always like to go where decisions were made. When you go back to the 2018 recruiting cycle, yes, I know it was short on numbers, but did Nick Saban counter – what Georgia was doing. I, I want to say it was like, what was it? Just it's tons of prospects. And I'm, I'm trying to get that number real, real quick pulled up, but uh, like tons of five stars, tons of four stars. Did Nick Saban counter it with youth uh, that Georgia had in the 2018 cycle? I guess what, it wouldn't be the 2017. Maybe it's why I can't find it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> seven five stars and 15 four stars. Did he counter the bleeding with youth an apprentice on the coaching side of thing and trade it off for youth. I mean, look back now, is, is that what he did? It, it was. I, I think it was It was a pure recruiting move. Um, and look, doesn't mean some of those guys aren't great on-field coaches. I think Pete Golding is, is uh, if you believe, kind of what you hear in between the lines, is on his way to being a, a long-standing, potentially long-standing assistant coach under Nick Saban. Carl Scott maybe doesn't get the credit he deserves. He's been a consistent force on the field as well as in recruiting. So I don't think it's purely recruiting, but the general theme it seemed like was to get younger, 
to get a little more with it. Um, but, but look, you know, the, the numbers were a big part of that. I think that was clear from the beginning. If you go back and look at that 18 class, especially if you add a guy who, who was basically a recruit in Ale Kaho, who was a five-star, you know, it's a top five group. It's a typical Bama group, you know, per, per guy in terms of average star rating and things like that. But there wasn't enough volume. So perceptionally, which is such a big deal in everything, especially recruiting, it felt like a big drop off, especially to the Bama fans that expected national title, recruiting title. It's just like they go together. Um, so I think that was was part of why there was was a real youth movement to make sure that when the numbers were going to be bigger from the beginning, which which this class of 2019 was always going to be a huge class, you know, Bama was was going to get an early start on it. And Bama was going to be able to capitalize and, and basically run away with the number one group. And that's exactly uh, what happened. And I think George is a big part of that, Ryan. No matter how you look at it, I, I said it the moment, probably on your show, when, when Kirby took this job, this was going to be the primary recruiting rival, which means not only going head-to-head -head for guys, but also countering moves with other guys. And you're seeing Georgia kind of do the Bama thing. They're not even honing in on guys in their state as much. And we all know how talented the state of Georgia is. I think Georgia's got four or five guys out of the top group in the state of Georgia committed right now in this 19 class. Georgia is going national. They're, they're using the Bama footprint. So it's going to create more head-to-head -head battles, but also um, more countering of each other strategically overall. So I do think a lot of what Nick does in terms of the overall recruiting picture does have a lot to do with what Kirby's got going on at UGA. Um, it's the only school to unseat Alabama in the last few years off of the field, and obviously they've come close twice now on it. John, there's so many different things that we want to talk to you about, uh, and, and, and I want to go to uh, Antonio Alfano from New Jersey becoming the number one player according to your publication, 24-7 Sports. Uh, talk about the what made Altono, Antonio Alfano jump this much. He kind of forced his way. You know, he forced our hands, I think. Um, first of all, this is a guy who's always been a dominant player, 6'4", 280 or so, position versatile. And, and when you're talking about a number one player in the country, you, you usually go with those priority positions, right? D-line, offensive tackle, corner, et cetera, quarterback, of course. Um, and he, he checks maybe two boxes there because he can play inside or outside, 4'8", laser 40, 4'2", laser shuttle. So you're talking about an elite tester with a great frame, um, good size as well. So he literally dominates everywhere he goes. And the only frontier where he really hadn't done that because he hadn't had the opportunity was on a national stage with the pads on all of that. Uh, he had a couple of logistical issues. I believe he got sick, so he missed the opening in the summer. So this move could have happened back then, but for whatever reason, he couldn't participate. So he had to do it during All-American Bowl week against the best. Great offensive lineman every single day, full gear strapped it up and, and he basically went and earned it. He was already the number eight player in the country. So it's not a huge stretch to move up seven spots. But um, when it came down to it in the end, there was just really a, a hard time trying to find out what kind of flaws he had, whether it's any of the top elements that we covered at 24 seven sports frame, length, ceiling, production, testing, um, all of those things. Alfano was, was at the very, very top. Um, and he capped it off, you know, in terms of athletically, about as well as he could have every single day out in San Antonio at the, the All-American Bowl. So um, basically it was one of those, you know, why not as opposed to why with Alfano. He really does um, hit a lot of the boxes that you look for. And, you, and just look at this draft, right? This draft is going to be a ton of D-linemen. Um, Bose is going to go number one overall. Quentin Williams is going to be right around there in the NFL. And there's going to be like 10 of the first 15 guys off the board along the D-line. That's what everybody wants. It's what they need. So this lines up with every single trend you look for in the projection business, which is ultimately what we do. We're talking to John Garcia as we continue talking about Alabama's recruiting class closing down on what is labeled as National Signing Day, even though Alabama's got a lot of their class locked up. Where does Alabama go from here? Give me a couple of names that, that you think Alabama can, can be a part of the conversation in the last few days here of, of this National Signing Day. Well, this is really the weekend that, that Nick Saban has built up to. Um, not only was he trying to put together a staff, they were trying to position visits the right way. And, and what, how it shook out was that last weekend was, was empty, which is rare 
this late. But I think that tells you how small the pool is of guys that Bama is really in on. Um, so they're built up to this January 25th weekend. Um, and, and the headliners, Henry Ta'o Ta'o, probably the top available linebacker in the country, period. Kid out of California, De La Salle High School, which is actually Tosh Lupoy's high school, which was a big in for Alabama at the beginning. But Charles Kelly actually recruited him uh, a good bit for Tennessee. And Tennessee's kind of a trending school with Henry Toe Toe. So there is some some nice overlap there for Alabama beyond the obvious pull um, and draw for the Crimson Tide. So he'll be on campus for his official visit. And then the guy we talked about the last time I was on with you, Brett Scyther, the big late emerging tight end, six foot five, two twenty eight, 228, out of Clearwater, right down my way here in the Tampa area. He's one who has exploded 30 offers. Everybody in the country wants him late. Um, Jeff Banks went to see him today or is seeing him tonight. Um, and, and Brett says Banks is the best pure recruiter that he deals with. However, coming off of a Georgia official visit, he's got the dogs number one, so Bama playing a little bit of catch up there. So this weekend, Toto, to, oh, Brett Scythe are the two guys that I'm uh, keeping an eye on down the stretch. And, and like we said before, I think maintaining verbal commitment going to be big for Alabama. Byron Young, a top 100 All-American defensive lineman. We just talked about how important D linemen are. He's committed, taking other visits. you got to hold on to him. Uh, and then at that same token, Chris Bogle, an edge rusher, a pure pass rusher out of South Florida, was another Lupoy recruit, um, a guy um, who, who was really close to him in the process and was kind of shocked when he took that Cleveland Browns job. So Bama has to repair some things there. Um, they want to hold on to him as Florida and Miami push for an in, what would be an in-state flip for them. So holding on to guys just as important as adding guys. I think Bama's you know, going to have more positives than negatives down the stretch and probably lock in that number one class in the country, which was uh, a long-term goal for Nick Saban, maybe a longer-term goal than previous number one classes. But, John, how hard is it to sell when you have so many unanswered pieces? Or maybe they're, they're telling some of these kids, maybe that's where we get the indication of these coaches because – is there some of these new guys already out on the, the recruiting trail? Oh, no doubt. I mean, Charles Huff is in, is in his, his DMV stronghold uh, today. He offered, I think, the number one running back for next year's class. Bama's going to take a heavy running back class next year. They offered the number one guy um, uh, this week, um, at least in that DMV area. So he's already on the road. A lot of these guys already um, hitting the trail. You know, sinceri has been a big hire in terms of perception and overlap, right? He came from Florida. Charles Kelly coming from Tennessee, a lot of overlap there in terms of targets. And Bogle's another one. Tennessee was a trending school in the spring and summer for Chris Bogle. So that effort to hold on to him uh, is actually aided by getting a guy like Charles Kelly um, trying to replace some of the recruiting prowess of Tosh Lupoy, who's one of the best in the country. So I think those things are helping Alabama down the stretch. But there's no doubt these new guys um, and some of these old guys, I guess, they're going to have to help put this thing together and close with some of these top targets. And again, some of these guys that, that are retained, Pete Golding, Carl Scott, Jeff Banks, we just mentioned, these guys are, are still uh, hitting it every single day with guys. So it's a really interesting collaborative effort, um, a true carousel, if you will, for each and every kid. But I think the one school that's been able to withstand so many coaching changes is Bama. As long as Saban is there, as long as that structure is in place, they've been able to hold on to guys. Um, despite losing coaches. Um, I mean, the whole the whole Mike Loxley thing, I mean, there were so many DMV guys where Loxley was a primary recruiter, Brett Key as a primary recruiter elsewhere, and they've been able to overcome all of these things, minimal decommitments, um, considering what, what we would have expected. If two months ago you said, hey, all these coaches are gone, you would have said, oh, my gosh, this was borderline disaster stuff. And, and here Alabama is running away with the number one class despite all the turnover. It's something that – is, is I don't know if any other school can, can do it um, quite like Alabama can, especially now that Urban Meyer is not technically coaching at this point. So it's pretty remarkable. The new guys are helping out, no doubt. But I think some of the, the retained coaches are also um, putting in big efforts down the stretch. John, let me ask you uh, about Sark for just a couple of minutes. Uh, he's also known as a, as a pretty good recruiter himself, right? So if he's the OC, and I know that would be a lot of responsibility, but um, that would also be adding another blue chip recruiter, right? I mean, w wouldn't it be that you would get some no production doubt. out of Sark? And, and, and what Nick has, has been really good at in terms of allowing guy, offensive guys to focus in is his offensive coordinator has always been able to focus in on a smaller pool of guys compared to every other assistant coach and really go to work. Um, and, and heck, 
the first guy to offer to a Tingle Vailo, I think most people know by now, is, is Steve Sarkeesian. You know, he, he's developed number one pick. Um, he, he has that quarterback mantra still with him. I think Sark is the only reason that um, one of the top 2020 quarterbacks is still committed. Carson Beck out of Florida, the reigning Mr. Football in the state of Florida, who just broke a bunch of Florida playoff records held by some guy named Tim Tebow. You know, that's the main reason he's committed is because of the reputation of Sark. I don't even know if they've spoken much yet, but the reputation has held his commitment. And everybody has sensed blood in the water with this kid, considering his top two recruiters were Dan Enos and Brent Key, both now departed. Um, everybody thinks this kid is very flippable, and he still may be, but the reason he's still verbally committed today is because of the reputation of a guy like Steve Sarkeesian. So he's going to focus on a smaller pool, um, but usually that means um, that hyper-focus can result in uh, longevity and, and early commitment sticking, things like that. Um, and, and he's got a good track record with identifying talent and acquiring talent, which is really uh, the essence of college football recruiting. And I think that's why he's good at it, and, and that familiarity – like we talked about with Sinceri and, and Kelly, although it's to a smaller degree with Sark, um, it makes a lot of sense here for Nick Saban looking to, to rectify a lot of those offensive uh, turnovers. We're talking to John Garcia. Best way to connect with him on the Twitter account, at John Garcia underscore junior there, helping us out as we always talk recruiting. He's been our go-to guy for many, many years. Uh, very busy as we lead up to National Signing Day. Let's go back here just for a minute because we've been giving – Tosh Lapoy, a lot of heat today with the ESPN article. I know you and I spoke via text message about that. But don't we owe Tosh a little bit of credit? Because if he knew that he had lost his play calling, chances are he probably knew that his days were probably numbered in Tuscaloosa. What does it say about his integrity and his work ethic that he kept the grind going on the recruiting front, even though he wasn't the play caller that maybe Nick Saban expected? and he lost some of that resp responsibility, according to ESPN.com. They've reported this uh, with Chris Lowe and Mark Slayball. What does it say about Tosh Lapoy continue to grind and, and be one of the elite recruiters to continue to help Alabama put together this number one class? I think it says a ton, and I think it's it's going to help keep that door open for, for whenever a college staff, and it may happen every year with his recruiting reputation, whenever a college staff says, hey, why don't you come back to the college level? You know, uh, you were pretty good there, uh, especially as a recruiter. Um, and I think that's that's sort of the leap of faith that Nick took on on him in the first place, right? You know, this was his first time as a coordinator, period, to my to my knowledge. So um, I think that was that's kind of the uh, the reciprocation that we should expect from from coaches who, you know, frankly got got thrown a pretty nice bone. You know, um, Nick Saban went out on a limb for him, and I think that was that was kind of his his rebuttal, his, his reciprocation of that to, to kind of, you know, be a soldier, a soldier on uh, through an effective demotion, right? I mean, we can call it what it is. So uh, I think that says a lot about his character. It says a lot about his mentality, his makeup. Um, and, and look, there was no sign of him slowing down on the recruiting trail. You don't get Chris Bogle on the commitment list without Tosh Lupoy. You don't maintain such a consistent relationship on the West Coast, period without Tosh Dupoy, and we can really run down some names if you go to previous classes, whether it's Dylan Moses, the aforementioned Tua, Najee Harris, Jonah Williams, the list really does go on and on. Uh, so I do think that that continuity was was really important for him on and off the field, and, and that's not easy for anybody to do. Um, so I thought he handled it with, with pretty good grace and, and to the point where I was surprised to hear the detail of, of when these, these changes started to happen and how long um, he was able to, to, to redirect and still, uh, you know, try to put some work in. I thought that was, was pretty big on him and actually made him reflect pretty well um, in that ESPN story, given, you know, the negativity that he's getting. Look, Bama lost the national championship. We all know the defense was, was different there um, for, for however long. But um, despite that, I thought in terms of the long-term success of his coaching career, I thought that was actually a positive for Tosh Lupoy, and I think uh, it gets him back, you know, that much sooner in the collegiate game. And, and, you know, like the kids say, right, it's not a loss, it's a lesson. So you hope for his sake that he that he does go through it that way. He's still a young guy, right? You know, sure he's still he pretty young. So sure I think he he's, he's going to be just fine. But it did reveal a lot of early um, early character traits that um, that maybe he does he wouldn't have if he didn't go through that um, at Alabama. 
John Garcia, you're the best in the business, according to us, man. If we were ranking them, we'd put you at a five-star, no doubt about it, man. I appreciate you so much. I mean, you cleaned up a lot of the loose ends, and that's why we lean on your expertise, man. I appreciate you. Crimson and Blue Chips, the podcast, and all the great things that John Garcia is doing, the best way to connect with him is simple. It's straight up, at John Garcia underscore junior, available there. Uh, Crimson and Blue Chips, the podcast, and the website they're doing with all that Alabama football content. I appreciate you, man. Thank you for being a part of the show, John. Always a pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for having me again.